We start today, though, with a developing story out of Washington. Second gentleman Doug Emhoff was evacuated from an appearance at a high school here because of a bomb threat. With me now are Stephen Portnoy, Nicholas Wu, and Amber Phillips. Stephen is a CBS News White House correspondent covering the White House for CBS News Radio. Nicholas is a congressional reporter for Politico, and Amber is a political reporter and author of The Five-Minute Fix for The Washington Post. Thank you guys for being with us today. Um, Steve, I want to start with you because, you know, that bomb threat really put a scare for many White House officials today. What can you tell us about what happened, about the event, and what has happened since? Yeah, we, it was mid-afternoon at Dunbar High School here in Washington, D.C. The vice president's husband, Doug Emhoff, the second gentleman, was visiting for a Black History Month event when a Secret Service agent came over and said, we have to go. Uh, somebody, apparently, there's been some kind of a bomb threat. The school was evacuated. Students were sent home. The ATF was involved in the investigation, but ultimately no device was found. Late today, the Secret Service put out a statement saying, quote, there is no information to indicate the threat was directed toward our protectee. So in the end, uh, Doug Emhoff went back to the vice president's residence up at the uh, Naval Observatory here in town, and uh, everything wound up working out fine. And do we know anything, Steve, about who made the threat? We don't know at this point. The investigation's ongoing. Both D.C. police, the FBI, and the ATF are all part of this investigation. All right. And I want to take a, a hard turn to another looming threat on the foreign policy front, because as the U.S. and our NATO allies continue to watch what Russia is doing on the Ukraine border, French President Emmanuel Macron met yesterday with the presidents of both of those countries, Vladimir Putin and Volodymyr Zelensky. Has Macron said anything about how they went? Yeah, he has. Engaging in a, a fierce round of shuttle diplomacy in the last 24 hours. Emmanuel Macron flying to Moscow to meet with Vladimir Putin, then flying today to Kiev to meet with Vladimir Zelensky, then going to Berlin to meet with the German Chancellor, who was just here at the White House yesterday. At a joint news conference alongside Zelensky, Macron said, quote, We talked with President Putin, and he told me he won't be initiating an escalation. But that was followed up by a spokesman at the, the Kremlin in Moscow today who said that if there were to be any such deal, it wouldn't be reached between Moscow and Paris, that the, the, France is not the party to which uh, any kind of agreement would be struck. It would really be with the United States. Emmanuel Macron is expected to be uh, having a conversation of some type with President Biden over the next uh, few hours or, or days. The White House told us today as uh, Macron reads out his conversation with Putin to his Western ally here in Washington. All right. Thank you, Steve. I know you'll be watching that. Um, Amber, I want to turn to you because I've been following your reporting on the constitutionality of gerrymandering. And now that the Supreme Court has ruled to leave in place a Republican-drawn congressional map down in Alabama, what does that mean for racial gerrymandering and elections in the future? I mean, this sends a pretty strong message for the future. It does. I think it's important to note that the Supreme Court, the conservatives on the court, including Trump appointees, actually overturned a ruling by a lower federal court in Alabama that had two Trump appointees on it. This lower court said, listen, this map in Alabama, it packs too many black voters into one district. When Alabama is a quarter black, there really should be at least two of the seven districts majority black. Can you fix that? Supreme Court said, you know what, let's leave this in place at least through the elections. That's a problem for Democrats in particular. Both sides gerrymander, but Republicans just control more of the pens in more key states. And so they're trying to fight these maps through the courts. And the Supreme Court has said a couple years ago that partisan gerrymandering, so packing Democrats into a district based on how they vote or Republicans in based on how they vote, is constitutional. They can't figure out a way to say it's unconstitutional, so they're going to let that stand. They've been willing to knock down racial gerrymandering. If Democrats specifically can try to prove that Alabama Republicans, for example, packed all these black voters into a district because they're black. The Supreme Court in the past has said that's unconstitutional in, in past cases. This time around, they didn't rule on the merits of this case, but they left the door open not only to leave these maps in place, but to say that it's okay, uh, that they're not going to rule against uh, what critics call racial gerrymandering. And that takes away one of Democrats' last opportunities to try to knock these maps down in federal court. And Nicholas, back here in Washington, House leaders scheduled a vote to extend government funding. Are we any closer to a longer-term agreement? I know they've been trying to find one for quite some time now. 
uh, a little bit. So actually, just now, the uh, House did approve uh, the short-term extension of government funding till mid-March. But you know, this is very this is very classic Washington, right? Like the can is being kicked down the line while a broader funding deal um, is being hammered out, and it looks like that could be in reach. Uh, you know, top. Uh, appropriators on both sides of the aisle indicated today that they that they were um, getting very close to some sort of agreement, and we could see the contours of that um, start to come into focus in the next day or so. Um, and but in the meantime, uh, we have the short-term government funding extension that will um, give them a little bit of breathing room to work out any remaining differences here. Another one that is so. As long as it stays open, um, we'll be we'll be tracking that closely. So, Steve, I want to turn to mask mandates and COVID because now four states are lifting their mask mandates in schools, double what was yesterday, despite a significantly lower rate of vaccination among children. How does that square with current CDC guidance? And where does the White House stand on masking? I know there's been a lot of confusion about whether we should, when we should. Um, so what are they saying about these four states? Yeah, frankly, we it doesn't square with the CDC guidance, which is still recommending universal masking in schools. The White House makes a point of saying that even in states where, for example, take New Jersey, where just yesterday uh, Phil Murphy, the Democratic governor, said to all the school districts in the state, you no longer have to require masks. It's up to each individual school board and each individual school district to decide whether masks should be required. The White House is leaning hard on that, saying, well, it's always been up to local school officials to decide whether masks should be required. And we would hope that local school officials would follow the science and, and the CDC recommendations and continue, essentially, to uh, require masks. But uh, this White House has gone out of its way not to criticize uh, the mm -hmm. governors, particularly the, the Democrats, who have been acting in the last couple of days, uh, by suggesting simply that uh, the expectation now is, is that local officials will uh, follow the, the science and the guidelines from the CDC. Uh, the press secretary yesterday did indicate that uh, she understands that uh, people are increasingly uh, wary of the, the COVID guidance. And uh, she said that here at the White House, officials are in constant contact with the CDC, monitoring uh, whatever their thinking might be in terms of what next to recommend for Americans. And we're also watching the protests escalate at the U.S. border with Canada, where Canadian officials are speaking out against, quote, foreign interference from Republicans in America. Amber, how are they involved in this so-called Freedom Convoy protest in Ottawa that we're watching play out? Yeah, like you said, we just far away from America. But I, former President Donald Trump laid down the marker for Republicans who might want to run for president or have a big name in the party when he supported these truckers. And it's really become a global, in fact, culture war right now, whether or not to support these truckers and just general pandemic restrictions like we've been talking about. We're at a time of great change for how the world views the pandemic and, and how much we keep ourselves locked up. So anyways, and after President Trump issued a statement, he undermined the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. He called him a far left lunatic. Uh, you know, he urged support for these truckers. Republicans who, like I said, might want to run for president, primarily Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, immediately came out and tried to find a way in, no matter how small, uh, to lay down that marker that they're on the side of the truckers for this culture war. For example, Ron DeSantis and an attorney general in Texas, Ken Paxton, Said that they would investigate GoFundMe, a website that has been a key source of funding for these truckers as they stay on the streets of Ottawa for, for days and weeks now. I don't know. I'm doubtful that this any investigations they launch is going to have any impact, but I think these Republicans felt like they had to do something to just signal that they're that they're with this like anti-vaccine mandate, anti-restrictions, really just anti being over the pandemic a kind of ethos that's permeated the Republican Party, especially here in America. Yes, a message that we've seen from very early on in the pandemic. Right. Um, Nicholas, reforming the Electoral Count Act is gaining bipartisan support. Can you remind us of how it came to take on such importance and where things stand right now? Because bipartisan, to the point that we were just talking about, even in a pandemic, is not a word we use often or lightly these days. All oh, bipartisan moments are fewer and further between right now uh, in both uh, chambers here in Congress. But well, what's going on here is this uh, 
It was a small effort on the Senate side, um, you know, a so-called Senate gang, um, a group that's working on some kind of uh, compromise. You know, they're still working on a lot of the details here to reform the Electoral Count Act, which is uh, this piece of legislation governing how exactly uh, the Electoral College results are tallied and certified here in Congress. This was something that Trump and his allies tried to exploit on January 6th uh, last year, uh, trying to you know, exploit ambiguities and here to find ways to overturn the election results. Um, all of that ended up being uh, batted down, but um, the vulnerabilities exposed there really spurred a lot of lawmakers to try to find some sort of broader compromise to make it harder to bring challenges to this law and to prevent uh, some more sorts of uh, uh, issues from coming up again. And so. Um, this is something that's come to the fore after the collapse of uh, Democrats' other attempts at passing electoral and uh, voting rights legislation. And uh, it, it, while the, there's still this effort going on in the Senate, um, you know, it remains being seen exactly what form that'll take. And if, uh, for that matter, Republicans are going to sign on to it. Uh, remember, you still need 10 uh, Senate Republicans uh, to break a filibuster and advance legislation. And, uh, you know, and until we get more details on what exactly all this might um, involve, you know, the jury's kind of out on how exactly this is going to shake out. Um, Steve, I want to turn to you just down the street where you are, because um, there's been another big name in the news today. Shortly after the White House's investigation into Dr. Eric Lander became public, he, of course, is the president's chief science advisor. He resigned. So how is the White House explaining the timing? Because it sure looks like Lander would have kept his job if reporters had not uncovered his behavior toward colleagues. Yeah, it sure looks like it. We're talking about the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is a, a cabinet rank position in this administration. And the uh, report came out yesterday morning in Politico that er Dr. Eric Lander was abusive to staff and demeaning to staff. The White House actually looked into these allegations in an investigation that culminated uh, in late January with uh, recommendations and suggestions that there ought to be corrective actions taken. Uh, but no decision was reached to fire Lander. Uh, then the report yesterday in Politico, and by last night, uh, Dr. Lander submitted his resignation. Now, Press Secretary Jen Psaki said today that this was not President Biden's decision, that President Biden was not involved in this decision, that it was Eric Lander's decision. But it begs the que two questions. One, what does it say about President Biden's day one pledge that uh, he would fire on the spot anyone who uh, engaged in a behavior that was disrespectful to fellow staff members? And two, as you suggest, Weecha, uh, if Politico hadn't reported the story yesterday and if reporters here hadn't asked about it yesterday, would Eric Lander still be working for this administration? I and other reporters put that question to Jen Psaki today. She said simply, it's a question for Eric Lander to answer. Hmm. Well, we will see if there's any more transparency the next time there's an investigation like this. Um, Amber, another one of the president's pledges is, of course, nominating the first black woman to the Supreme Court. And we are hearing that he started tapping potential Supreme Court candidates. Are we learning anything new about who they are? Of course, every everyone has a list going. And I wonder, yeah. is there a chance that whoever it is will not get the support of all 50 Democrats in the Senate, given how we have seen moderates Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema handle the president's legislative goals? I know this is something that you recently wrote about. Yeah, thank you, Weijia. It's a good question. I think on, on the first question, who is Biden going to pick? He'd said it would happen sometime this month. Uh, and we know that Democrats want to get this through as soon as possible. They'd love for this person to be on the court by the time they start their, their term in October and have these new decision, excuse me, have these new court cases to argue. Uh, so they want to move quickly. So we expect Biden to pick someone quickly. As for who that is, it's always been a short list because uh, there are not that many women in in the black federal judiciary. And that's to, excuse me, there are not that many black women in the federal judiciary. And that's typically where presidents tend to pick these people for, for the Supreme Court. Judge uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson has always been at the very top of the list. And she is someone, a source joke to me, I bet she already has a security detail the day that, that Justice Breyer announced his retirement. But she's someone that has gotten the support very recently of those two senators, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. They're, of course, the Democrats that have been willing to buck the party on really big issues like Biden's Build Back Better spending bill, Manchin tanked that, voting rights, uh, Kirsten Sinema in particular tanked that with Manchin supporting her. 
And so now Democrats really need to find a way to completely pivot away from using these two as a punching bag to hoping that, that the party can come together and have some unity because they do need 50, all 50 Democrats to get this person through because it only takes 51 votes, but there's a chance that no Republicans vote for this person. So Judge Brown Jackson actually has been recently uh, through this process for a lower federal judiciary pick, and she got the support of Mansion and Cinema, and that's one reason people I talk to say she's like the very top of the list. Mm -hmm. Another person that we hear a lot about is Michelle Child. She's a federal judge in South Carolina, and Lindsey Graham, a Republican from South Carolina, has said good things about her. He didn't commit to voting for her, but. I got to imagine Biden seriously considering her for the option to have this bipartisan, even if it's just one or two votes, bipartisan Supreme Court confirmation. Right. It is certainly something he ran on, on bringing um, both sides together, especially on something as uh, significant as a Supreme Court nominee. Speaking of bipartisanship, Nicholas, um, I know that you've also been working on something else. The House passed a bill ending forced um, arbitration in sexual misconduct cases. Can you tell us about how that issue came before Congress? Well, this is something that's been in the works uh, for years here in Congress. I'm after uh, the Me Too movement really brought a lot of this uh, to the fore. And what this legislation, the House passed yesterday evening, um, does is that it invalidates uh, these so-called forced arbitration agreements that basically prevent people from uh, taking their claims to court um, in cases of uh, sexual misconduct. And we saw a lot of this uh, come out with um, the, the sexual misconduct scandals at Fox and uh, you know with Harvey Weinstein as well. And so... Um, the House passed it yesterday in a pretty lopsided bipartisan vote. It's, uh, the Senate is expected to take it up as soon as this week. And this is really a rare bipartisan moment on a piece of policy that has been a long sought after goal. Uh, and uh, this is something that lawmakers in both chambers are really hailing as um, a sign of progress. Okay, Stephen Portnoy, Nicholas Wu, and Amber Phillips, thank you so much for covering so many different topics with us today. We'll see you back here soon.